this game is why teching for the meta is important. I mentioned this in a previous video, I believe, where I've been saying uh, both meta adaptation is important, and also I've been taking first lights because of that. Now, first lights, right? First light is the card that can uh, that can clear weather, clear all weather from the board, or rally a unit from your deck. So it's a pretty safe card that I feel is worth taking. I'm actually, I still am not really sure why it's not being taken more broadly. Uh, but anyway, so I pretty, I tried to tech at least one first light into my, into every one of my decks, assuming there's no mage because mages aren't all that popular. I think monster, my monster deck is the only one I don't take first light in because of the mage. But otherwise, I try and take it as much as possible because I want to counter those gold weathers. I want to counter decks like Airden that I've gone up against a lot uh, and things like that. Also, this is also an extension of uh, adapting my strategy to. Oh, this is really good. So this is <laughs> I need to go back. This is really important. I know I talk about spies a lot, but spies are seriously one of the most interesting cards in the game. One of the most interesting like mechanics and gameplay uh, aspects of Gwent. I'm going to see this up again. So I'm going first, right? Going first is awful. You're always going to be one card behind. You always have to catch up to your opponent's strength. You're so limited in what you can do. Now, how about I just counter that? Now, this is what I call using it. Oh, wait, did I do I play troll low? No, I think I play spy. Uh, so this is what I call use or it's not necessarily what I call. It's what's called using a spy to quote unquote flip the coin. So I'm going first. Uh, I'm one card behind effectively when I play a card. Just to catch up to his strength, I need to make sure to pass it. I'm going to use a spy so that I gain a card back, but I give him uh, some strength. I lose strength advantage, but I gain card advantage. And what's cool is that if he actually passes with uh, 12 strength on his side of the board and he goes back over to me, all I need to do is play... Um, I just need to play my Witcher and then kill the spy, and then I win the round. And I only go one card down, but that would just... Uh, and I win the round, which is fine. And then we go into round two, and I can bleed him as much as I want. So I play the spy. I flip the coin. And now the ball is in his court. He's going to be the one who's one card behind. But generally speaking, he's not going to want to pass. <clears throat> because catching up to this point total by this point is pretty easy. And luckily, really luckily for me, he plays a super low tempo play. I think that's part because he wants his round to go on longer and part because. Wait, yeah, I think it's just because he wants he wants this round to go on longer. He wants me to stay in this round and he wants to be able to capitalize on the cards that he has. Or the cards that he's going to be setting up like that card right there. Unfortunately, because it is buffed in his hand, because it can, uh, Quinn, I can't actually use my Witcher on it. But if I if it was unbuffed, I would use my Witcher on it immediately instead of the Spy, because this card will eventually surpass the Spy in points pretty easily. Even when starting from 8. It only needs, uh, like, what, 2 spells or something like that? So he kills this thing again, which is totally fine. Uh, by this point, I have changed my strategy to not rely on the... Siege supports, and instead I'm open to using my leader ability on my battering rams. Not only do I thin my deck out, it's also a really good tempo play, and considering how far behind I am right now, I want to be able to use my Hensel right now. Or just about right now. But I still always have in my back pocket the, the ability to Witcher the, the Spy, and then that's an 18 strength advantage. Or 18 point strength swing. So I play my Ballista. I, I made a mistake here. I should have hit this. And I noticed this like immediately after I did it. I should hit this, kill this, and then hit this. It's relatively minor, but it does. Uh, it's just something I should be in the habit of that I didn't do. It would have been an one extra point. Yeah, it would just basically would have been that one extra point. Also, it stops the ability of him being able to somehow decoy it or whatever. So I'll go ahead and use the Witcher now. Like I said before, I'm going to use it on the Farseer because the Farseer scales up so incredibly fast. And just get rid of that. That cuts off one of his legs, basically. Because <laughs> he loses one of his uh, super high tempo scaly plays, which is nice. And using uh, Eskel, the Witcher, on that card is so much wor is worth so much more than using on Spy. 
And now, so take a look at the situation, right? If he, because I use the spy and I have a lot of high tempo plays now, and he's been playing a lot of low tempo plays. We were to the point where I, even though I played a spy on his side, I'm still like a pretty considerable amount ahead. What is that? 17 points. And we're on equal cards. So if he does pass right now, I will win the win the round on equal cards, which is really nice. Even though I went first, I flipped the coin with a spy. But just to note, you shouldn't use the play. You shouldn't play the spy to flip the coin if you're not able to catch up with an, to their strength total on one card. I was able to do that because I had Eskel. Or if I had something like a, a C support already on the board, then I'd be able to pass that strength total with uh, Henso. So I'll go ahead and play Troll Lull out here. I'm just setting up for a little bit longer round. I don't have any C supports out, so there's not really any reason to rush into using the poor flanking infantry. So I can just wait and then use my uh, heavy cavalry. Speed this up a bit. Oh yeah, and I was saying uh, the the point of this video is to, that using that spy and that the flip the coin is a very good point. But also, but more importantly, the reason I made this uh, the point of this video, the lesson is uh, at the end. If you want to see what that is all about, make sure to skip to that part. So I actually get punished pretty hard here. I don't think this is something I necessarily really need to play around all that much. Um, but I set myself up for Igni by putting Kira here on the melee. I hope that's her name. It's what I've been calling her. I put her on this melee row and then buffed all three of these so I can get the max worth out of that Thunderbolt potion because I want to get more armor on Trollo because I plan on stripping that armor anyway. And funnily enough, he actually pulls into Igni and uh, and punishes me for that. At least I think this is this game. Yeah, he punishes me. Not only do I lose that 14 strength Trollo, uh, Trollo I also lose that 8 strength armor, which is really sad. That's a huge hit. So that was like 5 plus 14. No, no. 14 plus 8 is 22, right? Plus 5. That was a 27 strength gold. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. So now I'm just playing the PFI to get them out of my hand, to call them out of my hand because it's not really necessary to keep them. And I'm, I'm perfectly content going into round 3 same cards because I have Dijkstra. And if he wants to win this round, he would have to play one card. I was completely uh, prepared for that. That wasn't just like, oh, wow, we tied. How about that? I actually, I was counting out the points and I uh, weighed the options of uh, if he passes on same cards, is that fine? Is that okay? And I thought, yes, that is. If he happens to play one card that goes way above my tempo and I'm ready to pass, yes, I am. And then there's that. Uh, I actually don't remember him playing that. How do I react to this? My first, my gut instinct is to pass, but I wonder... It's only it's only eight. It's gonna end up being twelve though. So yeah, I go ahead and pass. That's that's basically what I was thinking. Yeah. So like I was saying before, like I was I was perfectly fine. I was perfectly fine with him playing some some card that would uh, force me to pass because I played PFI at that point in time. If I had trolled a little, this this round would have gone a whole lot differently. I've actually surprisingly been getting punished by trolled a little quite a lot lately. It's kind of sad. <laughs> Or not, uh, not trouble. I mean, Igni. I'm getting punished by Igni a lot. Like I got hit with. Uh, <laughs> I stupidly lined up my Dun Banner heavy cavalry's uh, like 15 strength each, and it just so happened to be that. And then my opponent used uh, something to draw Igni out of his deck, like luckily, and just annihilated me. So this is uh, a situation in which I'm using Dora Gray to um, basically play a card, but not really play a card. So basically, effectively, I'm playing Ekamara because Ekamara go plays into the next round. It's like I didn't really give up card advantage, or not. I did give up card advantage, but I didn't necessarily give up a strength advantage. It's really nice to be able to use that, being able to have carryover like that, to play the the required card to win the round, but still get something that carries you over to the next round. And six points doesn't mean a lot, but it's, as you, if you've seen a lot of my videos, you'll see that I often win <laughs> by like one or two points. So six points does matter. Okay, and uh, keep in mind, I still have a first light in my deck. 
and I have eight cards left. So drawing into it, it's not very likely, right? But I have a Stennis, so I'm going to use Stennis to make, to thin my deck out just a little bit more so that when I do eventually go for the Dijkstra, the chance of drawing to first light is much higher. Oh, and I double thin it out too because I get the Commando out, of which I really dislike these Commandos. I've too often I've like Stennis into a Commando or I've Dijkstra into a Commando. It's so annoying. I feel like there should only be one of those in there. Ah, there it is, right? He played the Ragnarok. I was almost expecting this because... Uh, Specialists go Tau for some reason. They love gold weather. They'll often run, like, I've often run into Sko Tau that run Ragnarog, Ragnarug, and Drought. So that's why I have this tech card in this first light. Now I'm thinking this is my only opportunity. I don't have any more deck thinning in my hand. I need to get rid of this gold weather as soon as possible. There are six cards left in my deck. So uh, one first light out of six. That's a one out of six. Uh, that's a, yeah, one out of six chance. Whatever, math. <laughs> one out of six and then i get two opportunities to do that so that's like what that's two out of six right no no because it's one out of six and then it's one out of five yeah because you take a card out so one out of six whatever math it's basically i don't know math whatever it's a pretty it's a relatively low chance to draw into it but i'm going for it anyway and there we get there we, there it is i get on the first Card, clear skies, clear that Ragnarok out of here. Ragnarug. And even get a siege report for my troubles. That's why Dijkstra is awesome. That's why using Dijkstra at the very end is so great because he can pull spells and not just units. Ah, uh, it feels so good, man. I would have been taking like six damage a turn or four damage a turn almost right here. But because of that Ragnar, because of that first light that I tacked into this deck. Which is not a part of the original deck list, by the way. I added that myself. And I've added that to pretty much all of my decks. Except for the ones that have mages in them. Because of opportunities like that. Because I'm running into so much gold weather. Because I'm running into a lot of uh, Frost Ayrton. Having a first light, I feel like, is so good. Because also, because a lot of people aren't really running it. I feel like it comes off as almost unexpected. And people don't necessarily play around it either. Uh, it feels so good. I probably would have lost that round if I had not cleared that Ragnarug. Also, like, the six-point carryover helped a lot, too. If I had not had the six carryover, it would have been 48 to 50. If I had not cleared that Ragnarug, it would probably would have been something like 40 to 48. So, like, just, like, like again, like, I mentioned this in a previous video as well. There's so many little micro-decisions that end up winning games. So many little things. Granted, this deck, the deck I'm playing is very powerful, and it kind of makes up for a lot of mistakes, but at the same time, like there's just there's a lot of nuance to it to be able to effectively squeeze all that power out of it. You can, ah, oh, crazy, 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 crazy. That was so close. A lot of my games have been so close lately. Ah, uh, so that's it. Uh, in the first round, using the spy to flip the flip the coin while also still having a backup plan just in case they pass, and going to round three, using Dijkstra to pull out first light and teching first light to counter gold weather or a lot of weather. That's pretty much it. Thanks for watching.